Dear friends, welcome to a new program, um, a very, very veggie program. Is this some sort of part of the vegetables? No. No, it's <laughs> not, not even a vegan program. No? No. Wrong studio. What's the... <laughs> um, John Mackay, International Director for Creation Research. I'm not going to tell, like, you're the first time here. You just have multiple citizenships mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all around. Thank you so much. For uh, to our dear friends at Alpha Omega Studios here in uh, Timisoara, Romania. Um, one thought. A week ago or so, we were in uh, a smaller setting, uh, not far away from uh, a university in Cluj. And we've had a group of students from I guess geology, biology. Uh, it turned out that was quite obvious. Some of them were so against anything that can, came out of your mouth that in the end one of them came to you uh, and had a, because I just wasn't there, um, but had a, a conversation with you on potatoes because he was growing potatoes. And <clears throat> if we uh, if we can understand anything of uh, the results of any teachings that students have, it's how they're going to apply uh, what they've been taught. So I guess this young man, I don't know if he was a student already or he was formerly or whatever, but he actually had a discussion with you uh, according to the results of what, we, what he believed processes in life should end up into. So he had a discussion on potatoes as related to what he believed evolution should be, or change should be. Uh, what was the case? I just didn't understand the whole issue. <laughs> well, you're quite right. There were some very antagonistic university lecturers there, some antagonistic students, and uh, his argument dealt with the humble potato, yes. or as we call in the British-speaking world, the spud, right? The what? A spud. Spud. Yes, it talks about the Society for Protection of Underdeveloping People because you remember the big potato famines in Ireland and things like yeah. that? The potatoes were dying and they were hungry, so okay. that's where the word came from apparently. Yeah. Okay, what do you know about the potato? Is it native to Hungary and Romania? Um, yeah. Native very to much now. Yeah. Very much now, but yes. I use the word native. Did it come from here? Mm, no. I don't, no, you I don't see. Think so. You grow them, well, some big ones, and you yeah. grow some little ones. Yeah. And I've been growing potatoes since I was a boy, always enjoyed it. They're so easy to grow, you just find an eye, you know, a little spot on it and chop it off and you can plant that in the ground and a whole potato vine will grow. But they were brought back from the Americas with the explorers, you know, in the 1500s, 1600s, and we've gotten really to like them. And as a result, there's been a lot of plant breeding. Mm -hmm. Now, the significance of this is our meeting with the university students was about creation versus evolution. evolution. And the young man said, but look, even here at the university, we've managed to turn potatoes into bigger potatoes. Mm -hmm. That proves evolution. Mm. And so I had to remind him, look, you've managed to turn potatoes into potatoes. Mm. Are they a different yes. species? And they're not even a different species, no. they're just potatoes. And we've been breeding potatoes for hundreds of years now, and we've got big ones, long ones, skinny ones, fat ones, etc. And we've managed to turn potatoes <laughs> into potatoes, right? Now, the reality is what he's doing is following Charles Darwin's line of argument. Mm -hmm. As the world has celebrated both the birth of Darwin and the 150th celebration of his uh, Origin of Species book, you can pick up his book and there's no doubt about it, he was influenced by what was in his garden, right? We have in agricultural science been playing with plants and animals for years. You can put the potatoes down now and we'll eat them for lunch later on if okay, you like. Okay, hang on. This is a part for commercial. Folks, watch this. This is an imported potato. Bring your imported potatoes to Romania and you'll get these. <laughs> <laughs> if you work hard, right? Yes, exactly. And then if you grow them in poor ground, you'll get that next year. 
Uh, so the reality is what we've been doing is for hundreds of years practicing artificial selection on vegetables, animals, plants, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, Charles Darwin's book is not just the origin of species, the next bit is by means of natural selection. selection. And so what he did was he looked at potatoes, he looked at plants, he looked at them and said, well, we have put a pressure on these animals. What's the point in growing little ones? We want the big ones. Amen. So we would take the big ones and instead of selling them, we would replant bits off them until we managed to selectively choose only cuttings that would grow bigger potatoes. Mm -hmm. And he said, if we can turn little potatoes into big potatoes, given long enough, hydrogen can turn into people. That's the extension that he's making. So a little bit of change in a little bit of time surely means a big bit of change is possible in a big bit of time. Now, do you recognize these other vegetables? According to the theory of evolution, these are all evolving from the small one. <laughs> well, no, small no, 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 that's just the potatoes. That's here, another right? program. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's obviously why you're the theologian. But have a look at these green ones. Okay. Because, you see, you expressed a certain dislike for this vegetable. No, I did not. I was just shocked and horrendously harassed by buying broccoli. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is a broccoli, there's no yes. doubt about it. It's a little dry, it's been cut off for a while, but mm. um, this broccoli here is not something that Adam would have known. Here, have a look at it and a smell of it. it smells like a paper production <laughs> plant. <There's>, uh, they <laughs> sort of go off really, really quickly. But Adam wouldn't have known anything about broccoli. Neither would have Noah. Oh, really? And do you know the name of this one? Yes, what it's is named it? after a, a famous rabbi called. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, you're the theologian. This is a cold rabbi yeah. beyond a shadow of yeah. a doubt. But you can see the leaves on this one and the leaves on these ones look fairly similar. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is a plant that Noah wouldn't have known either. Mm. When you have a look at this one, what's your name for that one? Cauliflower. Cauliflower, okay. Well, Abraham probably mm, knew about good. a related plant to that, but it seems he wouldn't have known about the cauliflower at all. Because there's one thing we've been doing with plants, not only have been selecting the bits we want, we've even been writing down the results mm -hmm. for thousands of years. You know, mm -hmm. words like asparagus go yes. back to the ancient Greeks. Oh, really? And we've kept records, or they kept records, and we've inherited some of them, sometimes in paintings, sometimes in, you know, on their stone mm -hmm, tablets. Mm -hmm. So we've got a fairly good bit of information about where certain vegetables come from. That's mm -hmm. how we know carrots used to be purple, mm -hmm. right? And we've managed to breed orange ones from them because the Dutch, well, they were the ones you're responsible. You know how the Dutch, their football colors are orange, right? Yes. But that's because they were ruled by the House of Orange. Now, if you're a Dutch farmer and you're after the money, mm. you can't sell purple carrots to the House mm -hmm. of Orange. Oh, yes. So you try and breed orange ones. Yep. And this is what you call political manipulation of vegetables. <laughs> so when you have a look, we've got records of things like potatoes, which are fairly new on the, on the European scene. But cabbages go back almost forever because this one here is your cabbage, correct? Yes. Okay. But when I have a look at what that was bred from, you find it's these leaves we started with. So if you go and you find wild cabbages, they are a big collection of leaves on a, on a fairly tough stem. Okay. And we used to just pick the leaves and eat the leaves. Okay. But then if you only can pick one leaf at a time, it's a slow way to have cabbage soup, right? <laughs> yeah. So therefore, the farmers decided, well, let's see what happens, right? This may have been conscious or unconscious. So they began to choose the plants that had more leaves clustered around the top. Now, this is the end result, a headed cabbage, because the wild cabbage, it's called the headless cabbage, right? It's got no head. It's just got the leaves that come out the side. Okay. So it's the headless cabbage, and this is the headed cabbage. Now, the interesting thing is cabbages can be selected because they've got flowers. In their second year of growth, the cabbage sends up big flowers, and if you watch carefully what the bees are doing, or if you artificially pollinate it, you can finally select the cabbages that have heads like this, right? Okay. And so you choose the flowers. <clears throat> but then some people, have you ever picked a flower and eaten a flower? 
Oh, what, the cabbage flower? No, no, not a cabbage flower. I can tell by the look on your face you haven't eaten a cabbage <laughs> flower. But have you ever eaten any flowers? Yeah, some. Okay, and you eat them because they've got a sweet little taste, yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and so some farmers decided, well, I've already got what I want here. Yeah. In the second year, this cabbage gives rise to flowers, and some of those actually taste pretty good. So they began to breed, not for the cabbage head, but for the cabbage flower. Right? And if you leave these in the refrigerator, then mm -hmm. after a few days, they'll begin to open up and you can see that this is just a lot of flowers. Oh, really? Yeah, so this is just the flowers of the cabbage. You will not convince me to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> but so that we get our broccoli because we artificially select it for the flowers. But wow. then some scientists, Give it to me. well, some farmers rather, uh -huh. they... Well, oh, some really? people they're like flowers. you, yeah, they're all flowers. Oh, some people discovery. like you don't like the smell of the green. So oh. when you get a mutation mm. which doesn't produce the green, mm -hmm. the green is now dropped out. This is also the flowers. That is very good flowers. You like the flowers yeah. because with cheese sauce <laughs> and a good bit of turkey, it mm. tastes really good. Mm. Okay, so all of this is natural selection. And Charles Darwin's book, which has been widely celebrated, tells us all about, well, if we'd been able to select for plants, flowers, flowers without colour, for the heads are full of leaves, then surely it must be possible for Mother Nature mm -hmm. over millions of years to select a fish and it's got broader fins and then it rests on the bottom of the sea. Finally, it gets bored stiff with the bottom of the sea and crawls out, pops up, has a look around and says, oh, I think I'll walk up on the dry <laughs> land, right? And, and that must be also an example of what natural selection can do. And eventually that fish turns into a feathered bird. Right, so Charles Darwin took what we obviously do and extended it. And these students were so antagonistic that if I can turn a little potato into a big potato, then given long enough, evolution is true. But you know what really struck me? Mm. Out of talking to those students, talking to the lecturers, etc., their antagonism was really not against potatoes or not against cabbages. It was against having a God who could create. Mm. That was obviously their motivation. Now, Charles Darwin, do you know what he did his um, academic training in? Yeah. Master of Arts in Theology. So, like you, you're a theologian, right? Mm -hmm. So when you went to Bible college, you studied what book? Oh, the Bible. Okay. And in Darwin's day, it was even more necessary to study the Bible because they had no competition like the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. The theologians didn't have to worry about the theory of evolution as a competing history of life. And we know that Darwin knew about his Bible because he quoted from it, mm -hmm. right? He records in his diary when he sailed on the good ship, the Beagle, that the other officers poked fun at me for quoting the Bible as an authority, right? Mm -hmm. So we know he knew his Bible. But the interesting thing is, by the time Charles Darwin reaches the end of his life, he has totally turned against the God of the Bible who created all things. And he said, Christianity, according to the text, seems to imply that those who don't believe are eternally lost. Mm -hmm. And he said, this would include my father, my brother, and most of my best friends. And if this is true, it's a damnable doctrine. So he understood yeah. the gospel and the consequences of rejecting God's free offer. So he then took and launched into his new theory. Now, would you read us Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, please? And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Now, Charles Darwin's book is about the origin of species. Mm -hmm. These are all in the cabbage kind. Mm -hmm. We call this one the headed cabbage, or Brassica cephalus, right? We call the wild cabbage Brassica acephalus the one without a head, right? Mm -hmm. We're using Latin, of course. Yep. And here's your favourite. What was the name of this again? Colrabi. Colrabi. And the leaves have actually congealed here around the stem. And oh. what we've selected this one for, mm -hmm. well, see the fat stem here? Yeah. This has been selected for a swollen stem with just a few leaves coming off. Mm -hmm. And so we've chosen bits and pieces of plants, but in the end, these are all cabbages. Mm -hmm. Would you like to know how we can prove that? 
eat by eating them. Not only just by eating it, because that may or may not satisfy someone's proof, but they all have flowers, and the flowers I can take the pollen off one and fertilize the other, and I'll get a cross. I can mm. get a green broccoli with a fat stem, right? Or I could get a headed cabbage with flowers. Okay, and so you can actually interbreed all of these, and the crossbreeds are successful. Mm -hmm. They still produce after their own kind. You just see more or less of the flowers, more or less of the leaves, more or less of the stem. Mm -hmm. Now, I grow potatoes in Australia, um, and I have, I think, about 12 varieties. Guess what the colours are? All sorts. Yeah, red ones, yellow ones. You can have white ones on the outside that are yellow in the middle. You can have purple ones that cook and lose their colour. There's all sorts of colours. But whenever I show them to my grandchildren, they're only this high, they say, Grandpa, what sort of potato is that? Mm. So they've got the fact that it's a kind mm -hmm. of potato, potato, right? And so they understand it. Children understand this better than that student at the university who said, if I can take little ones, turn them into big ones, then fish turn into monkeys. And you think, you poor student, you've been so brainwashed. Now, Darwin argued from the animals that we've bred. In fact, our commonest experience of animal breeding, well, what's the commonest animal that people around the world are familiar with? Dog. Dogs, dog. that's right. And have you seen what we've done to dogs? I mean, we've been breeding dogs for thousands of years. You can see them painted in the pyramids. They have the big hunting hounds, right? So we've had hounds. The hounds are mentioned in the Bible, right? Mm. There are dogs mentioned in the Bible. And we've had thousands of years to interbreed the dog kind. What are some of the results that intrigue you? Chihuahua. <laughs> That's right. The Mexican Chihuahua. You know, I've got three of them here in this pocket, right? And you bring them out and they look like hairy little rats, right? I don't know what other word. Why people would travel with them, I don't know. But I saw a lady, when I flew here, she had one in a handbag. And she opened up the handbag to let this dog pop its head out and breathe. And I thought, woman, you know, why are you doing that to the poor dog? And, of course, we have great Russian stag hounds. We have everything in between, British bulldogs right and we have managed to produce just about every variety possible by selecting the bits that we wanted you know why we bred bulldogs to chase what animal bulls good oh, really <laughs> I didn't know that so we, we have bulldogs with short noses so their noses don't get in the road of the bull kicking around the things like that right so we have bulldogs but they can't run very far are you serious this is why they bred them <laughs> we breed all sorts of dogs we have overt purposes and the thing is our breeding has become so bizarre that last year the Royal Society got into trouble for producing weird and wonderful varieties of dogs that were actually unhealthy. We'd selected really long skinny legs, really fat noses, lots of skin. I mean, your bulldog is the good example to yeah. start with. Its nose used to be that long. Yeah. Then we bred for shorter and shorter noses. We succeeded to get a short nose, but it's still got as much skin on as it used to have when its nose was that big, so it folds and wrinkles, yeah, and, right? and this produces and eczema. Tongue doesn't, fit in his the mouth. tongue doesn't fit in his mouth because <laughs> yeah. his bottom jaw is hooked oh, up, right? Poor guy. And so he's really an example of the degeneration uh -huh. of a kind, but not evolution, mm -hmm. right? And so this is the point we need to make over and over again. Mm -hmm. If you're wearing Darwin's glasses, mm -hmm. then what you see is every change mm -hmm. is evolution. Okay. But in reality, change is true, but the world you and I live in, sadly, unless we play God, and we try and improve it, it goes downhill left to itself. So you want to say, if you want to take a chihuahua, or theoretically, uh, and breed it with, uh, breed it with uh, Great Dane. Yeah, that would... It works, yes. You end up with a huge body and tiny legs. <laughs> <laughs> this is not Frankenstein's program. But that is what's happened. If you horrendous. look at some of the results, particularly now we have these designer dogs, you know, I walked into a, a clergyman's house. A designer in, dogs? Yeah, designer dogs. You can order a dog according to what you want, and they will genetically try and match it. So I walked into a, a pastor's place, a clergyman's place, and I won't say in which country, and this dog that was about this long and this high 
covered in hair at both ends. I didn't know which end to pat, right? Um, tiny little legs. And I said, oh, you poor degenerate mutant. <laughs> and the clergyman said, I paid £400 for that. And I said, well, you're a £400 degenerate mutant, right? And you can get any sort of dog you want now because of our genetic programming. But none of them are examples of evolution, mm -hmm. right? That's an example of degeneration, yeah, yeah. even though it's intelligently designed to be degenerate. Mm -hmm. It would never survive by itself. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is Darwin was half right. Mm -hmm. Change is true, but all the examples we have from our garden, from our farm, are examples of selection, mm -hmm. but not examples of evolution. evolution. Now I have to do something that is very very non-scientific yeah. and ask you what do you want to do with that oh my because, dinosaur tooth because yes. let me tell you the theory oh, there you are big teeth mm -hmm. sharp teeth flesh meat eating teeth yes why did you put this amongst your vegetables Remember the Bible tells us back in the beginning God made everything very yeah. good and in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27 and 28 and 29 the good God who made the good world who made the vegetables to produce their own kind also made all the creatures to eat the plants. Okay. Now we've run out of dinosaurs so we've got no chance to check by watching them eat, right? They're all dead, mm -hmm. which is not very good. Mm -hmm. But I did provide you with a, a report which just arrived over the internet mm -hmm. about an animal we normally think of as a carnivore, but uh, it's the top one of your list. Don't look at the one on T-Rex. I want you to read the one oh. that I put on the top of the list there. What's it called? <clears throat> Should I read all the... the, the just the read the heading. Vegetarian spider is Gandhi of arachnids. In other words, despite the fact that most of us are scared of spiders because we think of them as being animals that catch flies, suck them dry, they're meat eaters, etc. What we've now discovered is an increasing number of spiders that suck plant sap, that suck nectar. And now this one is proved to be a total vegetarian. Okay, hang on. I've never had in my house, not in my garden, any sort of spiders that are eating anything else than insects and so on. So you want to say this is a not a, a produced spider. These are just found in a no, natural this is habitat. Naturally found, and what seems to have happened, as it has happened with all other creatures, uh -huh. is if you look at the real history of change, a good world in which all the vegetables grew in a good created ground, uh -huh. and all the vegetables had been created good, uh -huh. and all the plants had everything, all the animals and had everything they needed mm -hmm. to get for their diet mm -hmm. from the vegetable world. Mm -hmm. So no suffering needed to be produced. The animals didn't need to bite you. Mm -hmm. They would bite the cabbages, right? And mm -hmm. cabbages don't sort of go, ouch, every time you bite them, right? They don't have that soul aspect mm -hmm. that animals yeah. and people do, yeah. right? So what you'll find is that in the beginning, vegetarianism was the norm. Then when sin came in, well, you know the verse, the wages of sin is? Death. And the first way it showed up is that animals start killing each other and we start killing them. And you see that tragic history until finally, the only way you can survive is if you've got teeth like this, you'd better be prepared to use them. It's sad, but it's true. But it's the result of selection eliminating. Mm -hmm. And so what we're finding is now the rarities, there still are some of the originals left. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered is, say with dogs, my dogs have got sharp teeth, not this big, mm -hmm. but my pit bull, right, my mastiff cross with a bull, he loves to eat fruit and mangoes and carrots. He loves that. Mm -hmm. But then that's what he was created to eat in the beginning. And sadly, we've degenerated him. You know, we've, we've lived on a planet which changes true, and I can't stress this enough, don't be deceived by the devil who is a liar, who is not telling the truth, who wants to get you away from the one who is the truth. Do you remember when you told me first time uh, I ever heard of that? Uh, some bit of information that really shocked me because I thought if I go to buying to buy dogs food, 
it's written on is beef or rabbit or whatever chicken okay I thought that is made of bunches of you know leftovers of chicken and beef and one day I had a you know just turn it over see what it's made of and it actually was made of 0.9 percent okay so less than one percent of it was any meat product most of it it was just vegetable grains so people are feeding their dogs and cats and whatever actually with vegetables yes that's so exactly right so so they're not uh, they, they, they haven't been created to uh, rip off anything and to eat uh, meat but even it seems to me that even um, retail sellers or you know dog food producers they they, they might know better the Bible than many people. Well, what would. they discovered was that they could sell your dog grain mm -hmm. provided they coloured it red and the person buying it thought it was meat, right? So it's really psychological. We've been so brainwashed by Darwin mm -hmm. to think the dogs have sharp teeth, therefore they have to be meat eaters. Mm -hmm. That we've forgotten to check with God who was there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no evidence that sh the dog's teeth have changed. It's always been an animal that ripped up its food. When my dog grabs a mango, it rips open the seed and then it chews the kernel that's inside. Mm -hmm. It loves the flesh, right? So, but it uses it for ripping. But what it rips now, in most cases, it's gone downhill. It can't get... I mean, the dogs here in Hungary and Romania, there's no way they're going to get those lovely, big, juicy mangoes. Mm -hmm. Half the year, there's no vegetables even for yeah, them to get because that. it's covered in snow. So therefore they make another choice. But the choice is real in a degenerating world mm -hmm. and it's produced the world that Darwin assumed was normal. Mm -hmm. He looked around him and said, death and struggle are real. Suffering is real. Selection is real. If that dog doesn't kill something, he's going to die of hunger or something's going to kill him. That's always been the case. Mm -hmm. And over and over again in our ministry, we reminded people that God always tells the truth mm -hmm. and in fact he is the truth. He told us in the beginning it was very good and change is true, but it's been because of sin. Mm -hmm. And he brought the only change that can ever affect the consequences of sin. Mm -hmm. Very good. One last question. We have less than one minute. Uh, John, where's that tooth? Um, okay. There's a one Bible verse in uh, amongst the Old Testament writings saying there's going to be one day again where the lion shall dwell together with the lamb and eat grass hay yeah that's right you know why i so suspect that's the case let's say this is a lion <laughs> is that made for eating yep. you'll find what it will do is be able to rip the plants then just like it can rip the plants now most cats still eat grass because yes. they can't digest ah. it but they can digest vegetables now, I'm going to give you some encouragement that new heavens and new earth that is referred to in Revelation 21, mm -hmm. even the broccoli is going to taste good and you'll enjoy it in those days. Well, and so. you won't need teeth so, like that. So, uh, the point I want to make now uh, to the end is that as it was designed in the beginning, in the beginning mm -hmm. this is why it's boldly stated that one day will come when the lion and the lamb shall dwell in the same place and, you know, yes. feed on hay. It's because it's not happening it doesn't happen anything new but it's going to get back to how it should It'll have be been a restoration in the yeah. with the problem of yes. sin dealt with so it's like god did it that way in the past what is happening now is just the consequences of sin yes it doesn't have to change anything in the end and uh, you know the teething of lion and so on to just have put back in a world without sin to, put, to restore the whole situation that was in the beginning interesting very good would you just take this last thought with you and um, remember one thing <clears throat> that what is happening with you today is just the in-between of the consequences of, of sin on our parents your, our parents as parents and back in the past unto Adam and the first couple um, so we just suffered of the consequences of, of that sin and of, of our own sins okay uh, as I said there's gonna be one day when the Lord's gonna put all back together as it would be even better than it was in the beginning but my question is how would you think of looking forward to that restored um, made even better new heaven and new earth uh, do you think it would be a place to carry your guilt with 
your sins with, with you. Or you would just take a, a very quick advantage of what has been provided as it's written in the New Testament at the, when the time has come, when the Lord Jesus came upon the earth and died, um, rose again just to provide that only way you would get rid of the consequences of the primordial and of your own sins. So I would encourage you to take our little stories and what I've been talking with Mr. Mackay and get reminded there is still time. If you watched this program, it means the bountiful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is still open to you. When After we're finished, just bow your head, close your eyes, and cry out unto the God who created you, who loves you so much that he gave his only begotten Son, begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, to provide the one and only way to salvation for you and for all those who would come, as he said, who are weary and hungry and thirsty and thirst and hunger for the eternal life. May the Lord bless you, as I hope you will hunger and thirst for that life that can come only out of his hand. May the Lord Jesus bless you all. Thank you much, very, very much, Mr. Mackay. Thank you. See you in the next program.